In the last year, John Prine has become very famous. No doubt his sad death has accelerated that fame process, but Prine's stocks had been on the rise for a few years before that, driven largely by the recognition of the young Turks of alt country and Americana, that he was a master. A superb songwriter who valued above all the craft and tradition of country music and its power to observe the human condition both in tragedy and farce. And also an artist with a great big generous spirit and the gift to inspire through that. Prine was born in Maywood, Illinois in 1946 and worked as a postman for five years before being drafted into the US Army. He was fortunate not to be selected to serve in Vietnam, but was sent instead to West Germany. Upon his discharge, he went back to his postal route and began to frequent local folk clubs. One night, worse for a few beers, Prine made a disparaging comment about a previous performer who happened to be standing behind him and challenged him with, you think you could do better. From there in, it was hold my beer and Prine hypnotized the room. By 1970, he was getting regular paid gigs, and by 1971, Chris Christofferson took him under his wing and helped him get a record deal with Atlantic, where he released his debut that very year. Prine's career divides into four phases, 1971 through 75, and his first four albums, which incorporated folk and bluegrass elements, with the odd venture into old-style rock and roll. After a three-year gap, Prine was back on Asylum with two slicker singer-songwriter albums in the Asylum style and one odd and disjointed album in Pink Cadillac. By this point, Prine's output was slowing, so he founded his own label, Oh Boy Records. Four years passed before Aimless Love, an album that fans constantly praise but tends to be overlooked by more general critics. Two years later than that, the sadly undervalued German Afternoons came along then five years before the Grammy winning The Missing Years. The last 20 years of his career saw five albums, only two of which contained original songs. His output was impeded by battles with throat and lung cancer, but the quality never dimmed in his songs and they never stopped reflecting the mischievous twinkle in his eye. We'll be looking at 16 albums, no live albums, no Christmas albums, and we'll disregard 2000's Souvenirs album, which was re-recordings of old songs. So let's get to ranking, and I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments. Number 16, Pink Cadillac, 1979. Determined to make a party album after the slightly dyspeptic Bruised Orange, Prime went down to Memphis and Sun Records and tried to bottle some lightning. Two songs, Automobile and Ubangi Stomp, notwithstanding, it's pretty much a flop. Prine's vocals sound mushy, and the other eight songs are all a little too uninspired. Number 15, Diamonds in the Rough, 1972. The problem with putting so many great songs in your debut is it means you pretty much have to start again for your second album. There are some good songs on Diamonds in the Rough, and the interpolation of a bluegrass feel shows a welcome growth, but I find the record is trying a little too hard for the New Dylan crowd especially in songs like Late John Garfield Blues and The Great Compromise. Number 14, For Better or Worse, 2016. In spite of ourselves, Little Cousin, this is another fine selection of country classics, but the level of performance doesn't quite rise to the 1999 charmers. There's some spirited moments, a duet with Casey Musgraves on Buck Owen's Mental Cruelty, Iris Dement, always a delight, helps out on two Ernest Tubblerette Lynn songs, uh, Who's Gonna Take the Garbage Out and Mr. and Mrs. Used to Be, and a nice version of George Jones's Color of the Blues with Susan Tedeschi, but on the whole not nearly as compelling as the previous effort. Number 13, Storm Windows. In the early drafts of this list, this album was as high as number 10, but it settled down the list because its greatest strength, its uncluttered, straightforward songwriting, also, upon a repeated listening, turns out to be its greatest weakness. It's also perhaps his slickest sounding album, which supports the songs, or brings out their lack of spark, depending on how you see it. Number 12, Standard Songs for Average People. The second of Prine's duet albums, this time with bluegrass legend Mac Wiseman. What an amazing career that man had. This record has a warm-hearted ambience of a couple of old pals playing whatever comes to mind. What I like 
best about this record is that if you wanted to explain to someone from Mars what Americana was, just handing them a list of the originals of the songs on this album would do it. It's an enjoyable immersion between one of the emeritus professors of authentic American music and someone who's devoted his life to soaking it up and expanding it. Number 11, Common Sense. It says much for the quality of Prine's songs that they can outshine even the obvious flaws in his records. Such is the case with the much maligned Common Sense. Song for song, Common Sense might rival his debut album, but like his later Lost Dogs and Mixed Blessings album, the producer, in this case Steve Cropper, seems to want to impose his own character on the record. The story is Cropper had been booked to do Rod Stewart's up and coming album, so he took Prine's tapes to Los Angeles and used them as a dry run for the production devices he wanted to use on that record. Whatever the reality, Prine was royally pissed off and quit Atlantic for asylum. Number 10, Bruised Orange. Prine was married three times and his two divorces gave us three albums, Bruised Orange, The Missing Years and Lost Dogs and Mixed Blessings. Of these, the weariness and heartache show strongest on Bruised Orange, which has some very good songs. One very strange one in Cebu Visits to Twin Cities Alone, and some that sound like busy work to keep the blues away. It's a wintry album, at best autumnal, but in Prine's playful patches of language it represents a light at the end of a hibernal tunnel. Number 9, Aimless Love. Rather beloved by fans and critics, this was Prine's first album not to chart, which is a pity because it's full of the kind of songs that Nashville and country radio needed to be hearing in 1984. Prine started co-writing on this album, six of the ten songs, including work with the ubiquitous Roger Cook, who seemed to appear in just about every episode of The Past as a Foreign Country. The title track, People Putting People Down, the boisterous bottomless lake and the classic country weeper unwed fathers all contribute to a very strong album. Prine is in great voice but the production is still just a little too close to standard Nashville to truly realise the record's potential. Number 8. In Spite of Ourselves. I like this album very much. The song selection is perfect, virtually a primer for 50s and 60s country music albeit with a slight bias towards George Jones, who gets four of the songs, Mel Walker, Here I Come, We're Not the Jet Set, Let's Invite Them Over and We Must Have Been Out of Our Minds, performed with spirit by Prine and partners who get the songs and are not overly reverent towards them. Prine's sole original, the title track, is one of the most beloved songs in his canon and his only solo vocal, Dear John, I Sent Your Saddle Home, is stonkingly good. Not the best album on the list, but very possibly my favourite. Number 7. Fair and Square. Prine came back after beating throat and lung cancer with a downbeat album which shows for the first time a pessimism for human nature. Not that you'd know it from the opening glory of True Love, a goofy, charming song that fairly skips along, or the wry and I suspect allegorical I hate it when it happens to me. but. Some Humans Ain't Human drags on for an inordinate amount of time to say the same thing over and over again. Some of the songs Prine left off the album though are much more jolly fair. The Other Side of Town and The Unfortunate Tale of Safety Joe, which may have balanced the record a little better. Number 6. Lost Dogs and Mixed Blessing. A lot of fans don't care much for this album, especially Howie Epstein's production, which is in parts loud, aggressive, and more akin to that of his erstwhile employer, Tom Petty's stadium pedigree foe Americana. But true as it is that it doesn't always work, some of the songs are so darn good that Epstein's novel devices do find a new way of voicing them, particularly on the menacing Quit Hollerin' At Me. And the songs are good. New Train, an update look at the thankful ending of a relationship gone bad. Ain't hurting no one with a great verse about the time Prime first heard Little Richard. And some dry observations on the perverse occupation of songwriter. The lovelorn humidity built the snowman. The Dylan admired Lake Marie, which is frequently touted as Prime's greatest song. And the dry wit of Same Thing Happened to Me. 
But there are clunkers. Leave the light on is silly guff, and Big Fat Love sounds like Aerosmith, which is a step too far in the different for different sake stakes. Number five, German Afternoons. Worst album title, worst album cover, severely underrated album. Charming, folksy, with songs that range from the impossibly heartbroken to the bawdy, to astute character studies, to silly drunken nursery rhymes, plus a couple of country classic covers. Prine covers plenty of ground and he does so with assurance, swagger and genuine insight into his condition. The high point of the album, Speed of the Sound of Loneliness, charts every agonising twist at the end of his marriage to Rachel Peer, who was his bass player, and proves itself a rare exemplar of the highest form of self-knowing, being knowing that you don't really know yourself. Number 4. The Tree of Forgiveness Prine's final album is a lesson in the craft of economy. No song outstaying its welcome, each song saying something slightly different and moving on to the next. Each song is subtly shaded sonically from the last and, with the exception of Dan Albach's overbearing Caravan of Fools, a minor key? Really? This makes for a sprightly, beautifully rounded record. Prine has also reached the point and station in his craft that he no longer gives a damn for selling records or songs to other people. So the songs are either salty, irreverent or forthright, or some so emotionally unguarded they'd feel intrusive in the hands of others. Most every song is a highlight in and of itself, but summer's end, the rambunctious knocking on your screen door, no ordinary blue or the light affirming when I get to heaven are certain keepers for the Prine mixtape. Number 3. Sweet Revenge After the pummeling the critics gave Diamonds in the Rough, Prine came back on the front foot, snarly, snarky and salty through an album laced with equal parts cocksure swagger, check out the album cover, and tender sentiment. Here, he and much the same band as he'd used on his first two albums lay out a terrific batch of songs. Rockers like the title track, Onomatopoeia, often is a word I seldom use, weepers like Blue Umbrella or Christmas in Prison, reflective songs like Mexican Home, bluegrassy numbers like A Good Time or Grandpa Was a Carpenter, and hilarious shaggy dog stories like Dear Abby or Please Don't Bury Me. Only the accident leaves a bitter taste and I'm pretty sure Prine, as a good Illinois liberal, would be the first to tell you that. Number two, John Prine. A lot like Kiss's first album, and there's a comparison you're not going to hear too often, a lot of the songs that made Prine's reputation are here on his first album. Any one of Angel from Montgomery, Far From Me, Sam Stone, Hello In There, Donald and Lydia or Paradise could announce a major talent. But add the up-tempo screwball songs like Flashback Blues, Spanish Pipe Dream, Your Flag Decal to the mix, and you've got a damn fine album going on. 1971 was a year jam-packed with great albums, and this was surely one of the greatest of them. Number one, The Missing Years. A very difficult call ranking this above the debut. The songs aren't as instantly recognisable as greats, but they are great. They need to be lived in a bit as Prine has lived in them. Howie Epstein's production, which he got so wrong in places on the following Lost Dogs, is note perfect in a cut above the stiff folky by numbers on the first. Songs like All the Best, the rather wicked Sins of Memphisto, It's a Big Old Goofy World, Everybody Wants to Be Like You, and The Rockers, The Sentimental Picture Show, The Foot Stomping Daddy's Little Pumpkin, The Country Swing Tune, I Want to Be With You Always, populate an album with relatable characters facing situations and complications we've all faced. And his masterpiece, The Closing Jesus, The Missing Years, is not only most likely his most popular song, but also his most all-encompassing view of his cinematic, slightly surreal, and cockeyed comic world. And there we have it. If you're familiar with John's work, I crave you to opine in the comments below what should be high and what should be lower and what should sit just where it sits. If you aren't familiar with John's work, his Great Days anthology is a no-brainer prime primer that will see you right for a while and you can use it to branch out to wherever you wish to ramble. 
He's a great artist, and even though he's become a bit of a bandwagon lately, he is absolutely 100% well worth the ride. All that remains to be said is that until the next time we meet in good fellowship, and if the nasty YouTube police don't shut the channel down, thank you for stopping by, and may your Bojambo forever be right. Just.